Well, thank you for coming this evening with a Senator's game on. Uh, we're real happy to have an audience that uh, hopefully we can bring you back some of the interesting information we picked up in, um, in Los Angeles. A three-day conference down there, and it's the only conference in the world that is geared specifically towards prostate cancer patients. The educational weekend was attended this year by over 700 uh, conferees and consisted of workshops, support groups, uh, meetings, general sessions, panel discussions with world-renowned medical experts, addressing the treatment options available and giving data away out on cutting-edge research. The conference features, interestingly, two live on-stage biopsies. They were actually looking for three. I almost volunteered for the third one, <laughs> but uh, it turned out uh, this thing was, there's seven, 800 people in the room, plus there is a CD made for it for posterity, so I backed out. But uh, the, in, in retrospect, it might have been good to go forward with it because it was done very, very well. And I will tell you exactly what they, they saw when Dr. Brown did that. It was quite amazing, the clarity that uh, people were able, or he was, we were able to get as a result of the uh, technology being used. The conference also had an exhibit where there were drug manufacturers uh, and private clinics and others displayed their wares and information. The outline that I'll just mention that we plan to do today is to talk about the PCRI as background, uh, reference some of the expert speakers that were there. We'll talk about the start because there were some PSA screening debates that went on down there that were quite energetic. And uh, I think the conclusion that Canada had it right, which you'll see, makes us feel good that we have people that know what they're doing up here. The next phase after the review of uh, your PSA would be some biopsies. And then the next things that you'll find will be approved for treatment by the new treatments in the pipeline. We've tried to summarize these on a list and we have more detailed information on a handout by mail care. Uh, we've also got a listing of valuable websites which we've noted and listed them so that you can go and collect some of the information that's around. There are books and videos. One of the head people there was Dr. Morad, who has a, a quite an author, and we've got some very good books back there that I think you might want to take a look at. During the process, we discovered from the debate and just from the discussions that we do have enemies other than cancer that are involved in this process. A lot of it has to do with people who are trying to slow down costs, and as a taxpayer, I don't want costs to go wild. But also we have insurance people that are trying to drive down costs and not essentially bring forward the treatments. We have situations where there are very effective drugs that are coming out, but the conditions of approval are such that they don't get to a person unless you go through an ominous set of problems. And uh, just speaking with Dan earlier, we found that he was able to bypass some of these constraints, which we might mention. So now I'll pass it over to Lionel, and you can give your section here for a moment. Well, this is going to be a, an Alphonse and Gaston routine. Isn't okay. This will be an yeah, Alphonse and uh, Gaston. I didn't know where you went. <laughs> Eddie and I go back a number of years, uh, some 30 odd years, playing old timers hockey. And uh, Eddie was pretty nifty around the net. And so, uh, and I was a setup man. So, yeah, his uh, passes were always around my head. Well, no, I used to make the nice saucer passes. The saucer got kind of deep at times, but <laughs> the, uh, just to give you a background on the um, organization itself, the Prostate Cancer Research Group. They're based in Los Angeles. They're a not-for-profit uh, organization. Their mission is to provide uh, up-to-date and uh, scientifically based uh, information to, to prostate cancer patients on an unbiased basis. Their aim is to help patients to better understand the vast amount of information that is flowing around, to develop questions to ask their oncologists or their urologists while they're going through this process, and also to fill in uh, the voids of uh, that uh, particular patients may have. What they don't do is that they don't provide any medical advice. They tell it as it is without overstating the facts. Their resources, they have a helpline, a 1-800 number that uh, 
call that helpline. They have facilitators on hand to answer the calls and uh, to try and, and answer your questions or provide whatever support they, they have. They also produce um, uh, two publications. One is a quarterly magazine called uh, Insights. This is their, was their latest issue with uh, Ryan O'Neill on the uh, cover and he's, he's a prostate cancer survivor. And um, so that uh, has very good articles in it every, uh, every quarter. And uh, they also put out a weekly newsletter. They also have uh, guidance papers. These are papers that are made up and uh, distributed by PCRI by their staff. They have, some are volunteers and others are uh, salaried staff. But they, uh, they have one on understanding the statistics of your uh, risk for various treatments. And another one is on um, continuous versus uh, intermittent uh, treatment. Uh, the pros and cons of those two aspects. They have videos and teaching aids that are available. Insofar as their American counterparts are concerned, they will help people who call in to their helpline or to their office to, uh, to find medical expert advice and even uh, an expert uh, hospital or a hospital near their area that specifically works or focuses on uh, prostate cancer. So those are some of their their resources. Ed mentioned earlier on regarding expert uh, speakers. There was about 15 speakers at this conference, all very qualified individuals. We sort of just picked out four of them here. Mark Schultz, he is a co-founder of PCRI and a past president of it. He's a medical oncologist operating out of LA somewhere. He deals specifically with prostate cancer. His clients are all prostate cancer clients. He supervises some clinical trials. Another speaker there was uh, Dr. Moyad, who Ed mentioned is the author of several uh, books and publications. He's from the University of Michigan. He's more on the side of preventive and alternative uh, medicines and uh, the use of supplements. Duffy Myers is the founder and medical director of the American Institute for Diseases of the Prostate and is co-founder and president of the Foundation for Cancer Research and Education. He's also a prostate cancer survivor and an advocate of healthy diet. He does have a book that uh, I ended up buying because I think it's, it's quite an effective one. It, it moves your mindset towards, I guess everyone's heard about it, the Mediterranean type diet, but he's got some very good recipes and my wife is in the process of trying to uh, try them out for us. So I'll let you know how well they are. <laughs> Another gentleman was Dr. Charles Drake. He has his PhD in immunology and is a leader of the immune response in prostate cancer and he's currently the co-director of multidisciplinary prostate cancer clinic at John Hopkins University. All of these gentlemen were exceedingly good. They spoke well, they knew their facts, and they were able to participate in debates which they had later on. And it was quite, um, quite telling. The PSA screening controversy, we've heard about it. It's an ongoing debate over whether PSA screening leads to overdiagnosis, overtreatment, and the heart of the matter is the fact that the prostate cancer is a highly variable disease. Some cancers are harmless and don't require treatment, while others are aggressive and need to be treated immediately. Some believe that these harmless cancers are being treated aggressively and exposing men to unnecessary uh, debilitating side effects and driving up the health care costs. In the United States, the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force is the U.S. authority that is responsible for making recommendations on clinical prevention services such as PSA screening. The task force basically recommended that there should be no PSA testing for men outside of a core age group of 55 to 69, or those with a life expectancy of less than 15 years. The debate was quite intense, and it basically was around the question, did the task force make the wrong call? The heated debate between a radiation oncologist and a general internist whose work focuses on reducing harms while maintaining benefits of medical tests and treatment intervention. The general internist was the member and supporter of the task force position. 
The task force was a group of national so-called experts, and I say that disparagingly because this snuffy gentleman basically called them a bunch of jerks. And it was quite evident as the debate went on that his assessment, or at least this particular gentleman, was probably quite right. Because that was generally the consensus that uh, the clapping of the, uh, ind the audience indicated. 16 volunteer uh, members representing internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, behavioral uh, health, obstetrics, gynecology, and nursing essentially make up the task force. There is really no expertise with respect to prostate cancer in there. It turned out that the gentleman that was doing the debate for the pro side that it should be more testing, he is going to Washington and I suspect that from what he was describing, he will be taking over responsibility for the task force so they may catch up and do things more correctly. Uh, only one of the 15 experts pre present was anti PSA testing, and some of the colleagues referred to him as an idiot. <laughs> or more. Uh, several experts commented, and this was kind of nice to hear, that Canada's announcement of being pro-PSA testing was that we got it right. So that was kind of uh, a good piece of information. The problem that is involved in this journey, and I likened it to a journey because we first of all find out the PSA numbers are there and then we begin a series of treatments that get progressively more complex. The problem is how do we select the best effective treatment from such an array of options? Now Lionel and I are going to try and boil down a tremendous amount of information and hopefully give you some insights on that, but believe me, it is a tough job. The work that Dan is starting to do, and the reason I asked the question on clinical trials, is that knowing where the clinical trials are, how to get access to them, is certainly an important attribute when you're getting into the advanced prostate cancer uh, uh, fight. So the information that Dan can put together in Canada, I think will be a real valuable resource and have uh, people get access to it and will be a definite component of the prostate cancer support group organization. If it is determined that your chances will never be life-threatening, then there's no treatment would be considered uh, if you have a PSA number that says there's something happening. An active surveillance or watchful waiting could be the right choice. If the symptoms are limited to problems urinating, then taking a drug such as Advart to shrink the prostate may be considered. However, possible side effects with vision come into the decision as to whether you want to pee better or see better. Depending on the grade and stage of one's cancer, then there are more choices for local treatment, such as brachial therapy, which is the freezing approach, radiation, cryotherapy, or oh, brachial, sorry, I'm sorry, that's the seeds, radiation, cryotherapy, which is the freezing, or surgery for a radical prostatectomy. Other choices include systemic treatment, such as hormone therapy or chemotherapy. Combination treatments consisting of systemic plus local treatment is used for those who have a high risk or relapse instead of local treatment alone. And this was another uh, gem that I felt I, I got out of this conference was that let's treat things locally before you do a systemic treatment. And that would be you, you get into some surgery and that before you start taking uh, drugs that will totally affect uh, your whole organ organism. Uh, the other comment that uh, Snuffy uh, uh, had brought forward, I think, was in his practice. If you're having trouble or side effects with your treatment, you don't necessarily shut it down. The trick that they found that works very, very well is reduce the dosage. So that was um, another little piece of information that I felt was quite, quite useful. I'll deal with this one because it's close to home at the present time. Biochemical recurrence. After you've had all of the treatment, the radiation, the surgery and things, uh, your PSA starts to reappear. And this happens, unfortunately, in 30, five to 40 percent of the gentlemen uh, that have had these initial treatments within 10 years. 
It can be decreased by new technology, the use of PET scans before radiation, but if your PSA is doubling every three months, you've got a high risk. And unfortunately though, 80% of men with recurrence live well. Normally the first uh, treatment would be hormone treatment, and one of the questions that my oncologist had mentioned to me when I was going down there, he said, get some information on uh, what's the best approach, intermittent treatment or continuous. And fortunately, there turned out to be an article that was referenced down there, and it's a New England um, Journal of Medicine, and we have an actual date, but I, I would recommend anyone dealing with this issue can check it out. And the conclusion was that the intermittent approach seems to be uh, quite effective because you get a number of cycles through uh, before like, you get it, it goes down to zero, and then it comes back and it goes down to zero, and you can spread that out over a number of years, and you don't get a total debilitating effect as if you're on it for full time. There were uh, two guys standing near me, and they were talking uh, about, uh, and they were both on on hormone uh, treat or on um, yeah hormone treatment, and they had. Um, and one guy said he was on for two years and off for a year, and uh, the other chap said, uh, "Well, I'm I'm on for one year." And I'm off for two years, and uh, and then, as it turned out, there was another chap standing not too far away, and he said, "Well, I've been going at it for ten years now." He said, and he said, uh, "He's on for six months, and off for I believe two years, uh, and he's able to, with that regimen, to keep his PSA at a at a reasonable level, and he's he's been doing it for for something like ten years. So it was interesting to hear." As far as preventing recurrence, it doesn't guarantee uh, there will be no recurrence, but um, they were recommending that a person take two to 3,000 units, international units of vitamin D daily. I guess the big factor they, they were saying was, the, uh, was to keep your weight down. They think that the biggest problem hitting the U.S. these days is the uh, obesity which leads to other problems such as diabetes and, and just a more sedentary lifestyle. So keep uh, the weight down and improve uh, a diet to keep your heart uh, healthy. Exercise in a moderate fashion is, uh, is also recommended. Avoid toxins and of course monitor your PSA on a regular basis as required. Okay, advanced prostate cancer. It tends to, to migrate to the bones, uh, the first place it so it will tend to, uh, to go to. And they were highly recommending that one get a, a second opinion when you're diagnosed that you have, or the, or the doctor tells you you've got advanced prostate cancer. Seek out a, a second opinion. And seek it out from a, a, another hospital. They find that Zytiga is effective, but it gives us about 20 to 50% of the cases where it is not very effective. And I understand on, on younger prostate cancer patients, it is not as effective as possibly on the older ones. Extandi is another new drug that uh, apparently is more effective than Zytiga. And we talked earlier on about the intermittent versus continuous treatment. You know, in the uh, August issue of the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, apparently there's a very good article on the benefits of uh, intermittent versus continuous. One other thing that surprised me was the, uh, they were saying that if you are advised by your oncologist or whatever that you'll try this treatment, this drug, and it doesn't, let's say it doesn't work very well. They have found that drugs that are approved for some other types of cancer, like breast cancer or lung cancer, uh, are sometimes uh, effective on some patients for prostate cancer. So they call those off-label. They're, they're labeled for another type of cancer, but um, so they said, always ask your, your oncologist if there's some off-label drug that I could use. The new, uh, some of the newer ones, uh, radium-223, appears to be quite promising. Uh, these other ones, cabozanatib and Prosvac, Prosvac is on trial at the moment in the U.S. They claim that by 2015, another couple of years, there'll be eight to ten new drugs available for prostate cancer. So it looks promising, at least with all the trials going on, that uh, some of these new drugs will be beneficial to help in this regard. The most promising, according to them, an effective drug was cabozanatib, zofago, 
and um, Zitiga plus Xtandi. They're also finding now that if when you, rather than giving a specific drug alone, that if you give it in combination with another one, they have better results with them, with the combination. For example, if you give Zytiga first and Xtandi after it, you get a certain type of results, but if you reverse that, you give Xtandi first and Zytiga later, it's a different set of results. So it's, depending on the order they're given too, can have an effect on, on the individuals. Ed, you want a biopsy? Yeah. <laughs> I think I mentioned earlier uh, that biopsies really were sometimes unnecessary, but if you get a good one, one that has an indication that you've got the cancer, you're pretty lucky so that you can get rid of it. And what we did find a bit shocking, at least I did, was that there's a lack of quality control on pathologists that can lead to erroneous diagnosis. Uh, they just cut and paste, and sometimes it's not done carefully, and the wrong data can go to the wrong person. We've seen some of that on other uh, tests in Canada. Uh, also, in well-controlled clinical trials, the fellow from John Hopkins University admitted to the fact that 5% of biopsy results are wrong, and the Gleason scores do move up and down. So it was recommended that one should have a second opinion on a biopsy test performed by an expert clinic. So. Uh, that it might be something that is too late for most of us, but it's something that you might mention to some friends that the biopsy process could be flawed. A new biomarker test to determine if active surveillance would be better than treatment. Uh, there's a article that we have uh, from Insights that speaks about that. And the other kinds of new um, components of testing is something called Polaris, which measures how fast your cancer cells are dividing, hence the aggressiveness, and based, and will gives you some indication of the mortality risk. Decipher is another one we had some information on back there. It uses gene testing that also measures aggressiveness. It measures the activity of a large number of genes associated with prostate cancer to give a personalized assessment of one's risk of pursuing active surveillance. PMCT is a test that actually predicts when a biopsy is truly negative or has it missed the tumor, but does not indicate its aggressiveness. There's another test that can accurately predict if a biopsy was missed and spot it. This can help to avoid a re repeat biopsy. There's strong indications that some form of imaging, such as multiparametric MRI, should be formed rather than biopsies. They've got stronger MRI machines now. And this uh, doctor that did the uh, on stage biopsies, he, uh, he was showing us on the, right on the screen uh, how uh, you could actually see the different coloration where the blood supply was, was heavier, uh, that indicated it was cancerous, and uh, rather than, say, remove the whole prostate, they could go in and radiate that specific, specific area and uh, with success. In addition to that, uh, we mentioned that Ryan O'Neill was, um, was there as a prostate survivor, and he's a gentleman that had this Dr. Braun uh, perform the test on him, which was quite successful. Another component of treatment has to do with radiation, and higher radiation reduce recurrency, but doesn't necessarily prolong life. It seems like Hormone therapy plus radiation appear to be more effective as a, uh, a treatment. The cyber knife, which we hear about, uses more intense and focused radiation dosages, but can be damaging to surrounding tissue if the radiologist is not careful and accurate. And this, I guess, is just common sense. If you've got a good surgeon, he gets good margins without doing destruction of nerves and things in that area. And the same problem here with the cyber knife. If the person is not accurate, he can do a lot of damage to surrounding tissue. So the trick here is to get the best medical practitioner we could find. With improved imaging techniques, uh, focal therapy, where 
only the main cancer spot instead of the entire prostate is radiation has proven successful. They gave a lot of uh, information with respect to half-lives of various components. And the way some of these treatments are, you get a, a build-up dose, and then it lasts, say, for a few uh, weeks, and you need to give it another one. And the trick is to find the proper half-life so that when you are getting the treatment in the cancer area, that it comes with a full, full power. So the timing of these, uh, these pills and various things that you might get uh, are quite complex and, um, and need to be done by uh, qualified, capable people. Now, Calypso, the Calypso system is an image-guided technique that uses a tiny GPS chip seed in, in the prostate at the spot where the main cancer is so that the radiation beam can track it and accurately overcome any movement. I didn't realize this, but apparently the prostate is quite mobile. And when they're giving you radiation, uh, it tends to move. Now, with this little uh, chip, that they put on the prostate, it actually shuts the system down if it's wobbling a bit and gets off uh, course so that they can uh, make sure that you do get the full doses in the right spot and uh, don't get surrounding tissue harm. Another uh, new set of uh, treatments are based on immunotherapy. It involves combining two immunization agents, a primary and a booster, to trigger the immune system to attack the cancer cells. Prosvac is a combination vaccine which consists of smallpox and foulpox. It's administered six times and the trial results should be available within three years. Provenge is recently produced by the FDA and is a drug that activates the immune system and is taken over five to six weeks. It has few minor and temporary side effects such as chills and fevers. Provenge uses a dialysis process where a sample of patient cells are extracted and sent to a lab where Provenge drug is added and two to three days later the treated cells are reinserted into the patient. A new cocktail of Prezange plus Irvati is currently being trialed. Also trialing is a small dose of radiation plus Provence to break up cancer cells and kickstart the immune system. The downside of it that we overheard was that uh, to get on it, you have to shut down other treatments um, before you can be accepted for this particular uh, therapy. So if you have something going, it could be a risk to make that happen. This is the list of approved uh, treatments for uh, metastatic uh, castrate-resistant uh, cancer. Their names are, are listed here. But these are the uh, approved in the U.S. Now, whether all of these are approved in Canada or not, I don't know. I know Zytiga is is approved in Canada here. So there's quite a list of them that are available there now and I say the most of this list here the specialists were saying the most promising and effective is uh, Jevtana, Zofago and uh, Zytiga plus Extandi, the combination of those two. The thing that uh, came out at the conference as well was that uh, chemotherapy is, seems to be being pushed off as a treatment um, for prostate cancer with the advent of these new drugs coming in, there's less and less treatment of prostate cancer with, uh, with chemo. And I guess eventually it'll, it'll maybe disappear from the scene. Some new treatments in the pipeline that are still not approved, I guess, that are, these are under trial and whatnot in some cases, is uh, some of these immu uh, immunotherapy drugs, some targeted therapy where they put in the killer T cells to kill the, uh, the cancer. Prosvac VF, GVAX a vaccine, there's GVAX one, Yervoy, anti PDI. They say the preferred approved drug is Extandi, and the preferred experimental one, which is still in trial, is uh, anti PDI plus, plus Yervoy. They won't know until the trials are completed on that one as to whether uh, um, it may replace some of these other ones. In nutrition and health, um, the diet, as we mentioned, is Mediterranean-based to some extent and veg vegan. 
25 to 35 percent grain, a lot of vegetables and protein, but not from meat. Interestingly, I think this has always been true for people with arthritis, they know about it, but tomatoes are bad for your joints. Garlic and turmeric are good for your heart. The question of fish oil supplements was uh, raised, and I do have a summary here by Dr. Moirad, who has put 10 comments with respect to, um, to dietary matters, and he does have a section here, fish oil flops three times. He didn't seem to be keen on the fact that uh, fish oil was going to do too much to, um, to support uh, prostate cancer slowdown. But the issue here, and they made this point many times, is that you've got to get your cardiac situation under control. Now, being as heavy as I am, I recognize that I have a problem to go <laughs> forward. And uh, the idea of uh, fish oil is something that if you've got a cardiac issue, such as fibrillation, uh, you should be <laughs> keeping that on your, um, <clears throat> on your list. The other thing, we talked about toxins and that, but the other uh, rival was that sel selenium, which was a big heavy duty uh, item supposedly helping, uh, is really not useful and people should avoid it. Another one that was recommended and it's the most overrated and overpriced and over overhyped supplement is Reversitrol. That was essentially uh, to do all kinds of good things, but uh, it is no better than a couple of good glasses of wine, which I recommend, and they recommended that people take care of. Uh, the other interesting item in here that I'd like to share with you, it was the number one multivitamin surprise that Centrum Silver Study came out as being an exceedingly good uh, supplement to take because it covered off a whole list of things and is highly recommended and was the number one item that Moirad recommends. Well, again, the, the prevention tips, um, lifestyle, exercise, and stress relief, I think is fundamental. Um, the diet, basically keep away from the fats and uh, use olive oil instead of vegetable oil and get your fish. Fish is a bonus. So I think the, one of the um, comments again that stuck with me was that if you can get your heart diet organized, it's going to help your prostate cancer because more people don't get a second chance. If they have a bad heart attack, there's no second chance like we get maybe with prostate cancer. So they said, get your cardiac information up to date. And another uh, stress uh, point that was stressed was that you've got to know your numbers. I think this probably with anyone here knows that their PSA, knows what their PSA number is, but do you know what your HDL is, what your LDL, and all of these other blood components? So the plea by the people, especially the lady that was um, on the helpline, her article basically stressed that we should have a journal that gives us a running history of all of our numbers, and we should know that uh, in great detail. Uh, valuable websites. With all the literature that was available there, were, we managed to find a, obtain a, a, a number of websites that I think are, would be good to, for people to look at on specific topics. Of course, the first one is one on education and research, uh, PubMed is a good one on not only medical publications, but on trials as well, the government trials. So there's quite a list of them. They range from clinical trials and, and nutrition and education, latest treatments. So those are the, are the websites that you can uh, have a look at. The books we mentioned earlier on, Moyad uh, Promoting Wellness, for prostate cancer patients. He had an earlier one, I think it was out last year or the year before, promoting wellness beyond hormone therapy. Another one which I haven't seen is the uh, No BS Health Advice and uh, Guide to Male Sexual Health. And Charles Myers, uh, he has uh, Beating Prostate Cancer Hormone 
hormonal therapy and diet. He's more on the, on the diet side. A new prostate cancer nutrition book, and he's got this one on flaxseed, panacea or poison, a health manifesto. It's just a, a very tiny booklet, more or less. I think I mentioned earlier uh, the other enemies besides cancer that we're into, and the degree of uh, cost control pressures that are in uh, the government now, and also certainly the insurance companies do that as a matter of course, uh, I think it behooves an organization such as us, ourselves here, to be advocates for uh, making sure that things just don't get slipped by without us um, knowing about it. So the question is, I think, is to stay tuned in and to share information across the networks, such as Dan is doing with the Warriors Group.